Um, in preparing for tonight's talk, uh, I kept asking Martin, one of the organizers, who will be in the audience? You know, what will be their reason for coming to this event? Uh, will they be people who are interested in politics in general? Are they people who are interested in American history in particular? Or are they just people who like podcasts? Uh, and how much should I assume they already know about me? Uh, okay, well, there you go. <laughs> Do the survey. Uh, <laughs> so there was a good reason for me, I think, to be thinking about these questions. I wanted to make sure that I came up with something to say that would be interesting and relevant to you, uh, something that would hopefully surprise you but not confuse you, um, inform you but not make you bored. Um, and on a, on a very basic level, I wanted to make sure that my remarks made sense. Uh, and again, these are worthwhile goals. Whenever you're trying to communicate, you have to think about your audience uh, and what they're bringing to the table uh, to your interaction. Uh, and you know, with a sort of cross-cultural event like this, there's a better chance than usual even than that there would be some distance between us, that some mismatch exists between our, our reference points uh, or shared assumptions or shared knowledge. Uh, but then uh, Martin told me that most likely a lot of the people who are coming tonight will have listened to Slow Burn uh, and that they'll be here because they like Slow Burn. And that uh, was very reassuring to me because it suggested that at least once I'd already managed to reach you, uh, say something that made sense to you. Uh, you know, it meant that despite any potential language barrier, which I didn't quite realize how perfect everyone's English is in the Netherlands until I came. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Um, but you know, despite any cultural differences that may exist between us, slow burn worked for you, uh, even though it wasn't specifically calibrated to work for you. Um, and so all of this made me think uh, about the thing I want to talk about tonight, which is how should journalists, and audio journalists in particular, uh, think about the people who are consuming their work? Uh, who should we be imagining is listening? Uh, is there an average listener? Is there, is there such a thing as an average person? Um, how do we make something that is legible to a lot of people, uh, people who think differently from each other and from me, from us, the creators about politics, or people who take different things for granted? Uh, how do we do this without sacrificing our own kind of particularities or the particularities of the stories we're trying to tell? Uh, I'll stop talking so abstractly um, and give you some examples of how these questions inform the decisions that I make and that my team uh, makes when we're making our podcast. Uh, let me ask real quick, just for the record, who has who has listened to Slow Burn one about Watergate? Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, what about two about the Clinton Lewinsky scandal? Great. Uh, newest podcast fiasco. I'm guessing not a lot of hands are going to go up. First episode. Okay. All right. Yeah. First episode's on iTunes. That's, that's right. The rest, unfortunately, are not available in, in the Netherlands yet. Um, I'm told that they're working on it, um, but so far, uh, it's 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 only in some territories. Um, the uh, if you could come talk to me afterwards, we I might be able to help you. Um, <laughs> for 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 those for those who don't know, the concept behind Fiasco is not that different from Slow Burn. Um, every season, we take a seismic event from political history and we try to kind of capture what it was like to live through it while it was happening before anyone knew how it would turn out. Uh, and the first season, which came out earlier this year, was about the 2000 American election uh, between George W. Bush and Al Gore. Um, and so I wanted to play the opening minute or so of Fiasco for you. Um, tell me if this is not loud enough. It's not going to displace my phone, don't worry. Uh, so this is how the whole series starts. On Thanksgiving morning, 1999, a Florida man from outside Fort Lauderdale named Donato Dalrymple went on an impulse fishing trip with his cousin. The water was choppy as they took their motorboat out into the Atlantic Ocean in search of mahi-mahi. My cousin, he said, look for seaweed and debris, anything floating on the ocean. And I point out with my finger and I said, like, like that inner tube that's there? He goes, yeah, let's go around that inner tube. Dalrymple was 39 years old and he wasn't much of a fisherman. He owned a house cleaning business, which he still does. Out on the water, he followed his cousin's lead as they scouted for a good place to throw out their lines. Then, Dalrymple saw something. We were about 25 yards from the inner tube, never that close to it. And I told my cousin, I said, there looks like there's somebody on there, but they look like they're dead. When Dalrymple got closer, he noticed a tiny hand moving in the inner tube. 
His cousin jumped into the water to investigate. My cousin's in the water, and he's screaming, it's a baby. And he's pushing up, and I'm leaning over, almost falling into the water. That's how rough the seas were. And I, I snatched what we know today as Elian Gonzalez. Elian? So I'll, I'll summarize just quickly what happens next. It turns out that Elian Gonzalez was a Cuban boy who had been brought over to the, to the United States by his mother uh, in a tiny boat, uh, which capsized. Uh, his mother died, but Elian survived. Uh, and the question of what to do with him once he was rescued became a huge uh, political controversy in the US. Uh, Cuban Americans in Florida, who tend to be very conservative and also very politically powerful, uh, and vote for Republicans because they consider Democrats generally soft on communism, felt strongly that Elian was, should be allowed to stay in the U.S. with his Florida relatives, other Cuban Americans who had moved to Florida uh, and escaped the Castro regime. Uh, but the problem was that Elian had a father. Uh, his parents had been separated, and his father was still in Cuba, and he wanted him home. Uh, and so the, government, the American government, uh, then led by Bill Clinton and Al Gore, uh, took the position that he had to be sent home. Uh, and this led to a months-long scandal uh, that culminated in the, in the uh, kind of very abrupt and, and violent snatching of Elian out of the home where he was staying. And there was a very famous photograph that I'm sure a lot of people here will recognize of a man with a big machine gun pointing at little Elian's face with the guy whose voice you just heard holding him, actually, um, in a closet. Uh, and this led to a, you know, to a gr great impact on Al Gore's uh, chances in the 2000 election in Florida, um, because these Cuban-American votes that he was hoping to get to put him over the top in Florida, he lost due to the Elian scandal, because the Clinton administration was held responsible for his, uh, for his expulsion. Uh, so we were making a few bets when we used this as our opening scene for this season uh, of the show about the 2000 election. One, we thought that people would be caught off guard if this podcast that they just turned on about Al Gore and George W. Bush started with this story about a baby being rescued from the ocean. Uh, they wouldn't know why they were hearing it. Uh, we thought, two, we thought their brains would kind of send a zap of recognition at the words Elian Gonzalez at the end of this passage you just heard. Um, a name they remember, but maybe not very well, uh, in which they certainly don't associate with Al Gore's defeat in Florida. Uh, and so three, we thought that we could cr create what I guess is called in digital journalism a curiosity gap, uh, where we could make people curious about what connection is there between these two things that they vaguely know about, this thing with Elion that they half remember and this election that they know the beginning of and the end of, but not necessarily the, the, the middle. Um, so inspiring that kind of curiosity at the beginning of our show was extremely important. Um, especially because it, when it comes to history, again, people, people, people know the ending. You know, with Richard Nixon, they knew he would be ousted from office. Uh, with the Clinton impeachment, they knew he would be impeached. Uh, so we have to find ways to sort of inject suspense into our stories uh, where otherwise none might exist. Um, and so uh, we make a rule of sort of surprising them uh, by starting in an unfamiliar place. Uh, the difficult task is, is sort of figuring out what will be familiar and what will be unfamiliar. Um, and this is what I was getting at earlier when I talked about the assumptions we make about our audiences. Uh, the reality is that we have lots of different listeners. Some are older, uh, and they remember the story of Elian Gonzalez very well. Uh, others are young, and they're hearing it for the first time. Some are in the Netherlands. Some are in South Africa. Like, you don't really know what to count on in terms of pre-existing knowledge. Uh, and so how do you make a show that will sort of appeal across all of these categories? How do you make something that can really reach a large audience and be relatable to a lot of different kinds of people? Uh, before I sort of explain how I approach those questions, you know, I'll note that I, I don't think every person who makes podcasts or even any kind of journalism or art or anything has to think about these questions about audience necessarily. Uh, there's obviously room for you know, avant-garde work where the work does not have to be legible to a wide audience. Uh, what my team and I do strives to be sort of more populist. Uh, we are sort of unabashedly trying to be entertaining uh, and easy to enjoy. Um, we want the show to be like candy, you know, more than vegetables uh, <laughs> or glass, shards of glass. Um, but our hope, I, I think, is to make something that sort of rides the line, you know, that's sort of trying something new 
uh, that's trying to sort of hit a frequency that people are ready to hear, but maybe haven't necessarily heard before. Uh, and all the sort of art I love and get most excited about in music and film and literature <laughs> strives to kind of be on that line. Um, so that said, you know, how do I think about audience? Uh, what has worked well for me uh, is using myself as a stand-in for the audience. Uh, what surprises me? What is new to me? Uh, and you know, even though I'm just one person, I'm not necessarily representative of all of you or anyone else who listened to Slow Burn or Fiasco. Um, I think I gain a kind of like free pass with every different category of person by being authentic about what I know and what I don't know. Uh, and this authenticity, I think usually, at least I try to make it come across in my voice. Um, the best compliment I've ever gotten about the podcast is that I frequently sound amazed at what I'm hearing or what, I, what I'm telling people. Um, you know, you can hear in how I tell these stories that I, I can't believe they're true, uh, that I'm astonished that all this stuff really happened uh, and, and that I never heard of it before. Um, like at the beginning of the first season, for example, I talk about a woman named Martha Mitchell, uh, who was the wife of Richard Nixon's attorney general turned campaign manager. Uh, in the 70s, she was extremely famous in the US, uh, as famous as a Washington wife had ever been. Um, she was you know, on talk shows, she spoke at Nixon rallies, uh, but I'd never heard her name. Uh, the first line of the podcast of, of Slow Burn One is, I'm gonna tell you a story you've probably never heard. Uh, and so just like the Elian Gonzalez intro that you just heard from Fiasco, this was a bet uh, that enough people would be like me. Maybe they, maybe they were around in the 70s, but they've forgotten Martha Mitchell, or maybe they forgot her connection to Watergate, or maybe they're like me and they never heard of her in the first place. Uh, I remember my, my boss at Slate, who's probably, I think he's in his, what, like his 50s or 60s, uh, gave me a hard time about making this confession about Martha Mitchell. He said, he said I can't believe you didn't know who she was. I can't believe you admitted it. Um, you know, uh, but I got, actually got way more people saying to me afterwards, how did you discover her? You know, how did you ever dig her up? And the answer is like, well, she's in, you know, she's in all the books uh, about Watergate. You can, you can read about her in any, in any comprehensive uh, history of the, of, the, of the scandal. Just that I had never read those books. And you know, I'm sure many, I'm sure some of, the, some, of them, some of those books are very popular, but even so, just the, the, the details don't seem to trickle down in collective memory uh, very reliably. And only a very small number of, kind of plot elements and characters, which I always feel squeamish about calling real people characters, but this is the line of work we're in. Um, uh, only a very small subset kind of filter down into the kind of collective consciousness. Um, and, and so uh, this is why, to me, the most important part of solving the problem of a diverse audience is to embrace my own ignorance. Um, with Slow Burn and now Fiasco, I've taken this kind of to an extreme. Like the, the fact that I knew absolutely nothing about Watergate when I started, other than what I'd seen in All the President's Men, helped me a great deal. And it naturally led me to write the show from the perspective that I wrote it from, which seems to have resonated with a, with a number of people. Um, and sometimes it is you know, risky. You, you, you admit to things you maybe you should you admit to not knowing things that maybe you should know. Um, I'll play you one clip where I sort of made this bet in favor of ignorance and um, got mixed results uh, in terms of audience reaction. Uh, this is about Spiro Agnew, who is, the, who is Nixon's vice president. Um, I think I'd like heard the name Spiro Agnew, just because it's a weird sounding name and it stuck in my head, but I didn't, honestly probably didn't even know he was Nixon's vice president. I knew that Gerald Ford was Nixon's vice president because I knew he took over for him, but if you'd asked me like, well, what, what happened in between there, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Uh, and the answer is that Spiro Agnew had his own massive scandal uh, simultaneous to Watergate, and he was forced out of the vice presidency. And so here's how I handled that. In her book, Washington Journal, Elizabeth Drew writes that the vice president's ouster caused a frenzy in the nation's capital, that the restaurants were louder than usual, that the city felt drunk. We were kind of on a high. We'd never been through anything like this before, and we didn't know where it was going. Until I started doing research for this show, I had no idea that Nixon's vice president was forced out of office during the climax of Watergate, in a bribery scandal that was totally unrelated to Watergate. It was just this separate controversy that happened to unfold at the exact same time as this other, even more consequential controversy. But how separate could it be, really? So if you look on iTunes, uh, you'll see some reviews from people who say, I can't believe this kid didn't know anything about Spiro Agnew. Uh, 
who let him make a podcast about Watergate? Uh, he's totally clueless. Like, why should I listen to this guy? Uh, and, you know, it's, yeah, maybe they're right. Uh, you know, admitting to my ignorance in this case maybe cost me credibility. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't regret it. I think, in, in, you know, in fact, I was vindicated about a year after Slow Burn came out when uh, someone else, Rachel Maddow, went and made an entire podcast about the Spiro Agnew scandal, and it was massively popular, and it contained many, 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 many facts that no one, even probably those people who left the iTunes reviews, didn't know. Um, so I'm confident that you know, the know-it-alls who, who left me those reviews, uh, you know, they're wrong, I think. I think you should always embrace your ignorance and be as open as... As is, as is authentic about what you don't know. Um, you know and, and then basically trust that there are other people like us who have the same gaps and who don't know anything and want to know more. Um, separately, being authentic about your ignorance, I think, is useful as a reporting tactic. As you know, we're collecting interviews for, for, for our show. Um, it is a tool that I use. Um, it's something I was taught as a, as a young journalist. I think a lot of journalists are taught, uh, never pretend you know something you don't know especially when you're interviewing someone, the point of the whole enterprise is to get people to tell you things. And if you act like you already know everything, they won't bother telling you anything. They'll, maybe they'll think you're really smart, but you'll go home without anything useful. Um, so I, I try not to give in to that temptation um, when I'm actually talking to people. Uh, in working on political stories especially, uh, I found that ignorance is a useful tool for something besides just getting explanations or information. Um, it allows you to tell your interview subjects with real sincerity uh, that you're a blank slate, that you can be convinced of their point of view, um, that you have an open mind, you're not coming into the conversation with a bunch of preconceived notions. Um, no one wants to be interviewed by someone who already knows what they think. Um, and with politics, I think especially, there's an added layer of distrust, especially in the US right now. Politics is so tribal that our, you know, often our efforts, our efforts at Fiasco, previously Slow Burn, sort of to get all sides uh, are met with reluctance and skepticism from the people that we want to talk to, especially you know, people on the right who see that we were associated with Slate and therefore assume that we must be liberal ideologues um, who just want to prove a point. Um, and in my experience, it helps a great deal to be able to say truthfully without having to put on any kind of face or make my voice sound real that, that I really don't know what I think about the thing I'm interviewing them about. That even if I have certain, you know, maybe intuitions or uh, even biases, maybe that I can identify, uh, I simply don't have enough knowledge to take an unequivocal, uh, confident position about who's right, who's wrong, who's a hero, who's a villain. Um, probably the best example of the strategy working is my uh, success, my triumph at convincing Linda Tripp to sit down with me for an interview. Um, Linda Tripp, for those who don't remember again, think about your audience, uh, is the woman who worked with Monica Lewinsky in the White House and became her confidant uh, about the Clinton affair. Uh, Linda Tripp, who hated the Clintons, decided to start recording the conversations and ultimately handed the recordings over to uh, the special prosecutor's office uh, and sort of ignited the entire scandal. Um, Linda Tripp has a shelf uh, in her home uh, of books about the Clinton years and the Clinton scandals. Um, and she has little post-it notes attached to, you know, dozens of pages in each book. Like, you, just, you look at the shelf and you just see this rustle of post-it notes. And I asked her what they were, and she explained to me uh, that each one marked some kind of factual error or uh, misguided argumentation or misinterpretation of what happened or of her, of her story uh, that she had discovered while reading the book. So this is a person who feels deeply misunderstood. Uh, she knows that she represents a certain thing in the culture. She knows she stands for, you know, betrayal embodied. She knows she stands for, you know, the sort of conniving, uh, plotting, you know, just utter, you know, utterly untrustworthy person. Uh, she knows this is how people remember her. Uh, and by the time I got to her in, in 2018, uh, she was kind of done trying to convince people that she had anything to say other than what we already expected from her. Um, she had a very sort of hard-earned distrust of journalists in particular. Um, and so I had to somehow prevail over that in trying to get her to talk to me. Um, and so this is how my interaction with her started. I kind of describe it in this clip. Uh, this is from the beginning of episode four of Slow Burn 2. A few months ago, I was at my desk working late, going through a list of people I wanted to interview for this podcast. 
Linda Tripp was one of the first people I had put on the list. I didn't have high hopes when I dialed her number. I wasn't even sure I had the right one. But then, after a couple of rings, Tripp picked up. I recognized her voice. I remembered it from the 22 hours of tapes she made back in 1997, when she secretly recorded a series of phone calls in which her friend Monica Lewinsky talked about her tumultuous affair with the president. You have, you have a crappy personal situation, and you have a crappy professional situation. After I explained who I was and what I was doing, Tripp told me that she did not want to be interviewed. She said it had been 20 years since all this stuff happened. She had a whole new life now that had nothing to do with Bill Clinton or Monica Lewinsky. I knew about this new life from stories I'd read about Tripp. She lived on a horse farm in rural Virginia, and she owned a year-round Christmas store with her husband Dieter, whom she spoke German with at home. It made sense that Tripp didn't want to reignite interest in her past. But I kept pushing, saying I wanted to get her side of the story. After a few minutes, Tripp said something to the effect of, there's no way you would ever get it right. And when I asked what she meant, she just started answering me. And suddenly, we were talking. About half an hour into the call, I realized that this could be my only shot at interviewing Tripp. And though it was clear to me that Tripp did not think we were in the middle of an interview, she did know that I was a journalist, and there had been no discussion of our conversation being off the record. So, without interrupting her, I started recording the call. So I thought I was very funny to be recording Linda Tripp secretly. <laughs> and I was right, it is very funny. Uh, so there's a, you know, this is a gross thing that journalists have to do sometimes, which is kind of essentially manipulate people right, into being honest with us when it's against their interest. Um, this is a well-known ethical dilemma. Uh, you know, when does a pursuit of an interview subject cross over from strategic and persistent into Linda Tripp-style conniving and sociopathic? Um, and that was on my mind as I spoke to Linda Tripp over the subsequent weeks after that con conversation I just described in that clip. Um, as I was trying to work to persuade her uh, to grant me a, a real interview. The whole time I had this recording in my back pocket, wondering what I would do if she said no to a, re a real interview, would I use it or not? Um, I, I don't, I don't want to dwell too much more on this, we can talk more about it in the, the Q&A, uh, but, but here's what I'll say about it. I was able to be myself with Linda Tripp during those conversations when I was trying to convince her. Um, I was able to tell her the whole truth about who I am, where I'm coming from, what I believed, uh, what I wasn't sure about, what I was hoping to achieve with the podcast. Uh, and, and I could do all this authentically, thanks to my authentic ignorance. Uh, I could tell her that I didn't know what I thought about every aspect of the story. I could tell her you know, that I was truly waiting for my research and reporting to sort of coalesce into some kind of conclusion. Uh, I could tell her, and again, truthfully, this is, I think, a key thing, that what she said to me could shape my thinking and, and help me understand the story in, in a new way. Uh, and this you know, quote unquote strategy has, has really never failed me. Um, people can detect sincerity, I think. Uh, they can detect a tr true willingness to be convinced. Um, they can also tell when they're being worked. Um, Monica Lewinsky maybe did not have that radar up as much with Linda Tripp, but um, essentially ignorance strikes me as a one size fits all solution, whoops, sorry, solution to the problem uh, that I was talking about earlier with regard to audience and also this problem of getting people to talk to you. Um, and these are, to me, are the hardest parts about making the podcast we've been making. Um, if you're authentically ignorant, people on both sides of this equation, the listeners and the subjects, will trust you. Uh, and they'll have good reason to trust you, in my opinion. Uh, here's how the Linda Tripp thing turned out, by the way, uh, for those who haven't heard it. Basically, she agreed to an interview, uh, and I went up to her house with my producer, and we did a very long interview with a microphone where she could see it. Um, I didn't have to make the difficult decision of whether to use the tape, uh, but at the end of the process, I felt this weight on my shoulders, and I wanted to tell her what I'd done. Um, and here's how that went. A few months after my interview with Tripp, I called her to do some fact-checking and to come clean about the fact that I had secretly recorded our first conversation. Asking, you know, I was asking questions, you were answering them, and I was like, this, is, might be, this might be it. This might be my interview, right? And I, I don't know if she's ever going to pick up the phone again after I call her. Mm -hmm. So I started recording the call. That's fine. <laughs> I assume, uh, to be honest, I assume any time I speak to any member of the press, that's being recorded. Wow, okay. So, 
I was so nervous to tell you that, Linda. Because I, and I, and I, no, you've got to do your job. And I told you it doesn't really matter to me how this comes across in terms of how I'm perceived because uh, somehow I, I'm more concerned that you understand what I'm saying than your listeners. And then she proceeds to say, I don't know why I cut it off before she gets the punchline, which is, uh, and anyway, if you're going to do this to someone, like, it should obviously be me. Uh, so she got the joke, too. Um, anyway, and we still, we still text sometimes, so it uh, goes a long way. Um, all right, that's all I got. Uh,